Lincoln Drive neighborhood of a possible dike failure. Go, Carl. Word was sent out last night to Grand Forks that residents should consider evacuating. Today's breach in the Lincoln Drive dike reinforced their urges. They gave those people 15 minutes to pack up what they could and move out. I just got back from Sioux City a half an hour ago. I've been down there working. I am just trying to save what I can. Well, we're, I'm going to say this very cautiously, uh, hopeful that we can beat this thing down in the Lincoln Drive, but we're going to remain in a high state of alert and ask people to stay out of this area. And uh, we're going to take it day by day and even down to hour by hour as, and see how the thing proceeds. Mayor Staus, you say that the next 48 hours are critical. I think that the next 48, 48 hours for Grand Forks and East Grand Forks are very critical because the river is rising about a tenth every hour. And that would actually, they're predicting a crest of 51 feet 0.5, and we would have that crest by tomorrow morning. So we might even get some more water than that. With many of the city streets filled with water in Warren, cool temperatures overnight turned some of it into ice. That isn't helping the situation here as residents continue to battle the flood one day after the water had crested. The Kennedy Bridge, the only link still open between Grand Forks and East Grand Forks, was unaffected by the rising water. But farther upstream, the Burlington Northern Railroad Bridge was holding back a considerable amount of ice. I think this is devastating for everybody in Grand Forks at this point. The Red River's height now threatens more businesses along its swollen banks. Along 3rd Street South, just a few feet of raised earth lie between dry businesses and their possible devastation. This indeed is a crisis. Water from the flooding red broke through an earthen dike on Oak Grove's southeastern side, and the tidal wave spilled over into dozens of homes in the neighborhood. An evacuation advisory has been made in the low-lying part of western Crookston where the dike work is ongoing. While some stay and fight, others are heading for higher, drier ground. We've got an all-nighter in terms of a sandbagging effort, a huge undertaking tonight in East Grand Forks. Tell me a little bit about it. The mayor's asked that uh, River Heights area turn out from uh, 8 to 12 uh, for sandbagging and also uh, for filling bags and uh, from the Valley Elementary School area from 12 to 4 and the Crescent School from eight, uh, 4 to 8. And we need their people today or else we won't have to fight it tomorrow. We've got to get it done tonight. They're uh, predicting a crest of 51 and a half feet sometime tomorrow or Saturday. Right now the river level has risen to 50.89 feet. Uh, it's going to be an all-night fight on both towns. Jane, back to you. Residents at the Elmont Living Center received a rude awakening just after 5 a.m. as the threat of floodwaters forced them out of their home. The nursing home staff and emergency personnel loaded all 115 residents into vans and buses and got them out of danger. I got flooded out on Lake and Drive. I got flooded. Back in the 30s. So I moved out then. Now I got into another one. I've been looking at that raft up on the wall. <laughs> You think you're going to have to use it? We never know. Please listen for evacuation notices. We do not want panic. However, it is for your security because the dikes are leaking and the water is rising faster than we can get a handle on. So we are trying to keep these dikes repaired. It's been an impossible task through the night. Now, we have a new uh, river crest prediction for you. As of uh, just uh, minutes ago, the Red River in Grand Forks is now expected to crest at 53 feet, 53 feet tonight. We're live right now, and in the background there, you can actually see the, the Kennedy Bridge. It's still uh, probably two feet uh, uh, structure yet before the water comes up to it, but the clay dike right here where we're standing is uh, getting to be very close. If you just joined us, I think it's, uh, we should reiterate that uh, earlier this morning in the city of Grand Forks, they issued mandatory evacuations as precautionary measures. Mandatory evacuations as precautionary measures for four areas of the city of Grand Forks. Everyone living in this neighborhood, you need to evacuate. You need to evacuate this area. Tell us what the situation is at the moment, would you? Over in East Grand Forks, it's very urgent. The, the um, flood is just uh, t doing 
testing us, I guess, as much as it possibly could because it, uh, we put a sandbag down and you go away a few minutes and it seems like the river has risen that much and so we're just barely staying ahead of it. The Valley Golf Course in East Grand Forks is also underwater. Sandbags to protect nearby homes were again hauled by boat. But the Larson's family work was in vain. At 3 o'clock this morning, the water was too much. It was hard, I think, you know, after all that work and all that family effort to see it, to see it not hold. The words were not very encouraging when Byron Sieber from the, uh, Lieutenant Byron Sieber from the uh, EOC uh, first came in. He, he said basically that they lost Lincoln Drive, and I guess that's uh, pretty strong words, uh, but they definitely have some water coming over from the golf course. Jane, I'm at the corner of Elmont Avenue and Lincoln Drive where homeowners are literally watching the Red River slowly swallow their homes. Take a look at the amount of water that's rushing down Lincoln Drive into that neighborhood. You can only see the tops of those houses and the tops of street signs. This may look and sound like a swift moving river, but it's actually 8th Avenue South running into Lincoln Drive. Water has swallowed up homes here and left others in the neighborhood stunned, worried what the Red River has in store for their homes as well. We move stuff upstairs. I think it's going to get in our main level. Here's the problem. The river water is coming over the dike, so water is coming in from the east and west sides of the neighborhood. Homeowners just can't believe what they're seeing. We're very close to winning but really close to losing. It's that thin of a margin there, Terry, uh, according to officials in East Grand Forks. We just lost the, uh, I believe, the Minnesota Point. There was a dike that failed there, so that was quite emotional for me. My dad lives five and a half miles from there. And uh, although he is not affected, it's a lot of people that I've known all my life. Sanders says now is not the time to give up. We are now asking everybody to come back and help us save the, the rest of the town. We're looking at uh, sandbagging uh, all the way from the Louis Murray Bridge to the cemetery on the north end of East Grand Forks. I have prioritized those areas. The National Guard has 500 additional troops coming in tonight. They're going to work with us steadily all the time. It's just a staggering day here. And uh, to recap, uh, if you've just joined us, if that's possible, uh, Grand Forks and East Grand Forks, as well as other communities in the area, have been battling floods. And in Grand Forks and East Grand Forks, they've faced a situation uh, without precedent in uh, the two cities' histories. You can see the streets are completely covered with water there. Uh, the lights are on at that particular Valley Dairy store. Uh, a few cars are here. The National Guard is blocking traffic on 5th Street. The river le reading at 1020, which is obviously a little over an hour ago, was 52.65. And for those who don't know, the Weather Service jumped the pre crest prediction up again now to 54 feet. Uh, and that should happen. I believe the crest prediction was for Sometime late Saturday, late, late Saturday night. So there's obviously still a foot and a third or so that uh, could be yet coming into our area. So that also is incredibly bad news as well. Ah, uh, as they started telling us the crest was going to be 53, it went to 53 and a half. And when they said 54, we just all sort of looked at each other and knew that with the resources we had, that we could not accomplish that. They felt for all practical purposes we would keep that Kennedy open. Uh, no one thought we'd get to this level. But, uh, once you get over there for now, you're probably not coming back. Well, that's fine. Thank you, sir. You'll have to get by without me tomorrow. All righty. of North Dakota is going to end its academic semester uh, effective today. Uh, we encourage, obviously, all of our students to leave the campus and to return to their homes in North Dakota and elsewhere. With the yeah. news that the university class, ended its spring UN. semester yeah. today, the traffic headed out carried away plenty of UND students whose parents have been waiting to hear they're coming home. Some of the traffic, as you see, coming from downtown, heading out of town, has not gone through. Uh, and as we talked earlier about people going fast, going yeah, through here, uh, uh, here, here's what we were talking about. 
Here's the view just after 12 o'clock noon today, looking down to Mers into the city of Grand Forks. The entire downtown, like most of the neighborhoods east of Washington Street, flooded. This is 2nd Avenue South, where because of the deep water, only boats could get to the houses where people were left stranded. The Grand Forks Fire Department, the U.S. Coast Guard, and the Sheriff's Department all made boat rescues. The displaced residents wound up at one of the several shelters provided by the base. This one will house 2,000 people. The cots are out, and these beds of cloth and metal will now be called home. Residents living along Northridge Hills in South Grand Forks were told to leave in the middle of the night, but many are back again, reinforcing the sandbag dike that still holds back the red. They say they won't abandon their homes if there's any chance of keeping back the water. Families are stocking up before leaving town. Even dry areas are looking lifeless in Grand Forks. It is burning so hot that you can, you can feel the heat coming from the fire here. Firefighters are, are trying right below us to hook up a fire hose. Uh, they are having to dig down below the water and feel for it. Uh, that, that's the, the situation right now, and they're, they're trying to make a decision on, on what to do and trying to see if they can fight the fire at all. We put up a good fight, but we couldn't quite make it. And for your own safety, I am asking you to leave the city and come back when things are safe. Who would have thought, Terry, that water would be a problem uh, in a flood, but uh, they're having trouble containing this one. I don't know what to say. Flames engulf the old security building while firefighters tried in vain to find the now submerged fire hydrants on downtown city streets. We be out of here in about 20 minutes. No problem, but there's yeah, two people over there. Oh, you're going to be out of here in 20 minutes. No right? problem. Finally, those efforts were called off, and the rescue of those individuals still in the surrounding buildings ensued. There's two people on the roof over there. No, over. And earlier, the debris that was flying through the air had fallen on buildings across the street and down the block and there's smoke coming from another building as well so at least three or four buildings right now do have smoke coming from them and uh, that's why they're evacuating everybody out of the area and getting ready to dump right now. Finally the battle to fight the fire from the ground became so impossible they took to the air to drop with chemicals. I mean if you could see this desk, if we got a really <laughs> wide shot of this desk, you would see I mean, this is just a portion of all of the announcements that we've got in, people who are opening up their homes to the flood victims in the greater Grand Forks area. Well, it's a very difficult situation. Uh, the water's been continuing to come up. Uh, we're seeing water in about 50% of the streets now. And uh, uh, of course, the mandatory curfew is a difficult situation. Uh, asking also, the mayor has requested that people voluntarily e evacuate the city. Uh, many shelters are being set up right now, about uh, uh, 18 or 19,000 places have been set up by the Red Cross. Um, people are being directed to those. How optimistic are you that uh, this uh, fire will be able to be contained? Uh, if you would have asked me that uh, two hours ago, uh, I, I would have told you that I wasn't very optimistic at all. But right now, I am uh, I am getting very optimistic that uh, that we're going to we're going to be able to contain this uh, I into a smaller area than we had originally thought. This situation is very serious. This fire is jumping black by black. People are going to die if they don't notify us that they need to be rescued.
It's that serious. They need to notify us. They are dropping at an incredibly fast rate. I believe uh, they said during the press conference that that was about uh, 2,000 gallons of water at a time. Uh, again, a great concern in, in the United uh, Hospital area because of the English Cooley and, and the English Cooley Diversion Project was handling only so much of this uh, overland uh, flood water. What makes a community a place to live is not the buildings or anything else in that community, is it, it is the people, the spirit, and the faith that are in those people. And I will believe till the very end, and we will rebuild, that we are a place of excellence, and we will come through this. And there you can see what has become of uh, that part of Grand Forks. This is the security building. This is where the fire started. But several buildings involved in downtown Grand Forks within a four block area, I do believe. And just smoldering rubble is left for many of them. That's the one wall that's basically left intact on the side facing the river. Well, the people's attitude so far is pretty good. You know, I think it's uh, given what they've been through. But this water is going to stay up for three, four weeks, I would imagine. And uh, then we're going to be cleaning this up for two or three months. So I would imagine by the time that process is over, people are going to be brought up to here, you know. The current is running very swiftly. And I, quite truthfully, I was uh, amazed at how much damage and how high the water was at some of these homes. Do you have an idea of the, the, uh, where the level is now or uh, tonight? I, I heard it was around 54 feet uh, and uh, still rising. And uh, that's just, uh, I believe that, to tell you the truth. I'm about uh, three quarters of a mile from the Red River, the banks of the Red River, but actually the Red River has come to me. This is a frontage road. Uh, you can see that it's a weird mixture of river water and sewage. It's sort of a gunky, smelly, frankly, mixture of it. At Sandbag Central in Grand Forks, 15,000 sandbags are still being made every hour. They are being used to protect vital services, such as the hospital and telephone communications. Volunteers here say, they are down, but not out. Our uh, marquee out on front, we were claiming to be the leader in flood coverage as our <laughs> promotion, and now the flood is right, pretty much ready to overtake the marquee here pretty soon. Water world. You know, it's just water everywhere. It's uh, in both Grand Forks, East Grand Forks. Our community is just about completely covered with water, whether it be two feet, whether it be up to 12 or 15 feet. There's no more sandbagging now. There's no more diking. We did our work. We tried our best. Mother Nature beat us. It's moved forward. Let's do what we can to restore the community. President Clinton will be coming to Grand Forks tomorrow. And I'm sure when he sees the disastrous condition that we are in, we will get some assistance, much assistance. So thank you. Again, some historic homes along around this area. There are some uh, beautiful homes. Uh, along Reeves Drive, which isn't too far away. There you are. Uh, it's stunned. Your exactly. As, as I mentioned, you try to put it into words uh -huh. and you can only look and just go, how could this happen uh -huh. and this quickly? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. All is well for these East Grand Forks residents who were evacuated Friday from the Good Samaritan Center. They came to the Thief River Falls Northland Community College. And as you can see here, it hasn't hampered their card playing.
Several thousand flood victims from East Grand and Grand Forks have registered at this Crookston Evacuation Center. From here, they go to a dozen churches and schools that have opened up their hearts and doors to their northwestern neighbors. Just unreal <laughs> and it's scary. Residents here say they thought if any place in Grand Forks would stay dry, it would be their neighborhood. But it seems with this flood, the water is sparing no one. For Drayton, North Dakota, now it's a race against time. The sugar beet processing plant is being closed down. High school sandbaggers from neighboring towns have been brought in to help with the flood fight itself. What made you decide to leave? Um, Grand Forks, the, what we see on TV about what's happening in Grand Forks, and we just want to get one step ahead of all those poor people down there. On World News Tonight this Monday, the tragedy in the Red River Valley. You feel like you're going to wake up and find that it's a bad dream, but it's a true reality. At station WDAZ in Grand Forks, the newsroom has turned into a clearinghouse for emergency housing. Lawrence Sandlow uh, from Winnipeg has some rooms for a family. He says pets are okay. Thousands of people have ended up in the homes of callers who besieged the station with offers of spare beds, rooms, garages, even barns. What strikes you when you travel through here is that there are no voices, no sounds of life in a city, just an odd and very sad silence we're all sort of in this together the herald and the, the couple of radio stations that are in, on in town and ourselves uh, uh, trying to uh, keep the information flowing uh, at least as fast as the river if mm -hmm. we can that's right uh, it, it you can't even recognize the city anymore watching Air Force One uh, taxi around in front of the uh, media uh, viewing stand here. It's an awesome sight, of course. Uh, it always is. Looked to me like uh, Pat Owens just uh, got a hug from the president. Certainly this will be an area that the uh, president's uh, helicopter will spend a lot of time in, looking at the uh, damage from Saturday's fire in downtown Grand Forks. The rest of America has, I think, looked with great compassion and pain, but also enormous uh, admiration at the heroic uh, conduct of the people of this community and uh, of all these states in the last uh, several days. Devil's Lake was expecting flood troubles this year, but not someone else's. Now at least 2,000 Grand Forks flood evacuees live here. I can't wait till this flood like, clears out because I want to be with her again. They cannot definitely say that the river has finally crested, though they say it was holding steady and has been holding steady at about 54 feet. And that, as we well know, is 26 feet above flood stage. And no matter what you have lost, in this terrible flood, what you have saved and strengthened and sharpened and shown to the world is infinitely better. And you should be very, very proud of it. Uh, I do think those shelter, li shelter life is becoming a, a wearing factor on people's living today. I still think, frankly, that there's a lot of shock still in place. I think people haven't dealt with the hard reality of the days ahead. Is this a good day for you? Very, very good day. However, uh, it is very wearing. I did go in the hangar with the president when he talked to the people that are living out here, and the people were so kind to me. And a lot of them told me that you, Mayor, are holding us up. But I said the one thing I don't know is they're helping to hold me up, too, to get us through this. After 15 minutes of phone calls, Conrad arranged for a private contractor to begin work on the dikes. And I've told him, look, these people are ready to continue the fight. They're not right. throwing in the towel. Words that offered Pembina a second chance to defend their home against the red. But when the banner headlines and lead stories stop, the valley hopes the compassion and the help do not. Now we, we will cry and then we'll get strong and we'll move forward and we'll face whatever we have to and we will overcome it.
The flood of 1997 was trying for tens of thousands of people who fled their homes and their cities. Amid that chaos of those days, WDAZ stayed on the air, even while many of the people who worked here were dealing with that same chaos. Where would our families go? What was happening to our homes? And really, how could we do our jobs under such trying circumstances? We've gathered together today a group of people who, who played a critical role in our coverage of the flood of the century to talk about those days when the Red River overtook Grand Forks and East Grand Forks and WDAZ potentially had probably maybe its finest hour ever. Pat Sweeney, longtime sports director here, Bob Kerr, longtime station manager, both pressed into duty as news anchors during the flood of 1997. Chris Regenball, who's our chief uh, photojournalist, who perhaps uh, certainly more than anyone at this table experienced the flood uh, firsthand out at the front lines of the fire, and Terry Doolam, of course, the longtime face of the WDAZ newsroom with more than 30 years of service, and perhaps we'll talk a bit about whether this was the event for him in all those years of service. And I'm Milo Smith, and while I'm now a 10-year veteran of WDAZ at that time, in 1997, I'd been at the station just a year when the flood hit. So we want to talk a bit about what went on here at WDAZ, because we always have a lot of people, even now, who ask questions about how we did it and how we pulled it off. So, Bob, I guess since you're the station manager, we'll start with you. What do you remember most about those days, whether it be, you know, what's your, what's your most vivid memory of leading up to the flood or during the flood? Well, oh, thanks, Bob. I, I think a couple of them, and I still think about that. And probably the hardest decision we had to make was once we realized that the dikes were going to break, it was going to flood, we needed to decide what are we going to do as a media? Are we going to try and stay, or should we stay, and what do we do with the employees? And I remember we had a staff meeting, we have about 42 full-time people here, uh, and we explained that, okay, the commitment was made, we're going to try and stay. We had no idea how long we'd stay on the air if we'd lose power, but we needed people to work, and obviously we have, as, as uh, most media in this market, very young people. Uh, a lot of them had young families, they had pets to worry about, they had young kids to worry about. So what we did is we made a decision, okay, we'll have a staff meeting. Those that feel they can stay and help, please do so, thank you. Those that need to go home and tend to personal things, go ahead with no repercussions. A lot of tears were shed, a lot of decisions had to be made. And uh, finally we had about, um, I think about 15, 16, 18 people that decided to stay. Um, and it was very brave of them, and, and, uh, and for, so that's really my, my first memory. And then just the second one was getting a call from the mayor about midweek saying, it looks like, the, it looks like uh, it's going to start to flood, and would you sign the TV station on? And at about four in the morning, I put on a pink shirt and hadn't had a haircut or shave for about a while, and I told my wife, I'll be back a little bit, a couple of hours, and that was the last time I was home. So those are kind of the... Uh, we're over on east side now by the walking bridge. Is crosses the river and just uh, by the Sorley Bridge. As we were looking, as you can see, the walking bridge now, of course, it's been closed off uh, for a couple of days. And then the Sorley Bridge uh, over to my right, and we're right behind uh, Mike's Pizza and Whitey's. Uh, some of the water uh, right now, again, as you can see, over the bridge, uh, if you get an opportunity to see that flowing quite uh, readily over the bridge. And of course, the Sorley... I know, Pat, uh, we talked about pressing you into service to do news. I think the moment when... I for me, when I realized things were definitely going bad was when you were standing downtown by the jail, and which is several blocks from the river, and you know there was some urgency there. That was Friday night, I believe, and right. and you were talking about the fact that they were evacuating the jail. It was it was it was quite a surreal experience. They were evacuating the jail, and the water was just starting to seep into the downtown streets. Here we go. We are in front of the Grand Forks Police Station here on Fifth Street, and uh, water. Let me just step out of the way here. The water is seeping through on the street here on 5th Street as we pan farther down, which would be going uh, toward the southeast, I believe, here as our photographer Chad Ekron moves down uh, toward the Valley Dairy and the Mission Area. You can see the streets are completely covered with water there. But even before that, uh, I was stationed at uh, the dike on the Kennedy Bridge, the Highway 2 Bridge on the north end, and I've had people uh, for a while after that say, when I saw you doing a live shot at the Kennedy Bridge, I knew we were in trouble. But uh, that was Friday night. Mike Brew, our then news director, he had told us at some point that we would suspend sports for a while, and that was the point. They sent me out there, and I, I remember <laughs> the water lapping at the top of the dike, and I just thought, there's no way we can keep up with this. It's only a matter of time, and uh, I, I felt so out of place. I hadn't done news in 15 years since I was working at uh, KQCD in Dickinson, and it just reminded me of uh, why I preferred sports over news, <laughs> because somebody once said, 
Sports is a record of human accomplishment. News is a record of human failure. Well, <laughs> that was brought, brought to, to be true during that, that time for sure. And Terry, uh, certainly pressed into service at that time. To me, one thing I'll always remember about the flood is I had been here a year. We hadn't started the news at five yet at that point. You were our features guy to me as the new person in the shop, you know, very good at this, doing these, these stories that are lighthearted and yet you got pressed into service and, and I'll always remember the kind of work that you did uh, during the flood. What, what do you remember about those days? Uh, well, well, the reason for that, one of the reasons for that, I think, is because you were not, you, you didn't have a voice yeah, at that, the beginning. Yeah, I mean, you were here working and, and doing all kinds of things and up all night and all, all kinds of hours. But you can talk, so somebody had to sit and talk and, and read the announcements and, and all of that, and that's when I was pressed into service the first uh, time. Um, I knew we were in trouble. Uh, I think it was Thursday morning. Uh, Bob Kerr was at the station something like 5 or 5.30 in the morning, and I thought, if the station manager is here at 5.30 on a Thursday morning, something's happening here. So that, that was the first thing I remember. Again today, it's, it's difficult to decide which situation is the most urgent. The downtown fire, the, the water, uh, now the, uh, the uh, medical park area, uh, there's just things happening uh, uh, right on top of each other, one on top of each other, and we're trying as best we can under uh, fairly difficult circumstances to try and keep an eye on all of them. You spent a lot of time, in, especially, you know, after the flight, I mean, I, I can think of all sorts of, of different things, the president being here, but uh, really doing a lot of reporting as the flood moved north. And I remember you being on, on the boats, g traveling to some of these little towns that were hoping, I mean, at that point, Grand Forks has already lost its battle, and, and I, I just can't imagine what those people were experiencing as they were watching that water come that way. The town of Oslo itself is a good one so far. The dikes are holding, and the water appears to be going down. If the battle is not yet over, at least the first scrimmage has been won. When that was kind of in the back of, of my head, too, I was thinking, you know, like they needed warning, but I, was, I kept thinking, these people have to know what, what's coming their way, and, and that's kind of what, what kept me going for a while. It was obvious, but uh, uh, that's, that's very true. I always thought that we ought to keep moving sort of up stream with this story, and, and that's kind of what we did. St. Vincent was the scene of a furious flood fight yesterday, only a little less anxious today. The river is down, but only a fraction of a foot from its record crest. And 30 and 40 mile an hour winds continue to wear heavily on the community's ring dike. You know, it's kind of interesting talking about that because one of my early recollections uh, involved all the, the, the New York, the, the networks from New York. Right who still don't seem to understand that the Red River flows north. And I remember early on, like a week or so before, where they were all in Fargo. And <laughs> they think, well, the, the river is, is, is peaked, it's crested. They all went back to New York and it's flood is over with. You know, we made a phone call a couple of days later, said, excuse us, uh, it's still coming. And uh, yeah, and it came, that's for sure. Yeah, I lost my voice because I had just moved into, in November, a garden level, which is a euphemism for a basement uh, <laughs> condominium right next to the river in the old Elks Club, if people remember that building. And uh, somebody down the way from us, they started getting water up through their vents in the basement. And so everybody freaked out Thursday. I didn't come to work Thursday night because I had to start moving everything. And it was quite a coordinated effort. And we had a teacher who lived right next door to us. And he, a bunch of his students came over and helped us move. And uh, just moved everything out of everybody's condominium in the basement. It was all stacked upstairs in the hallways. And, um, but I had been going in and out to the garage. And then when I came to work Friday morning, then all of a sudden I lost my voice. Happening uh, just recently, uh, some National Guard uh, vehicles were going by honking their horns very loudly. I don't know if you've heard if they've expanded uh, the, uh, the va va evacuation zone uh, down farther south. And I, I remember some woman felt bad for me. And all of a sudden, this vial of, uh, of some aloe vera that you were supposed to drink showed up at the station and I tried it because I was desperate to try anything but uh, it didn't really work, it didn't taste all that good. But uh, certainly then we move, well it's hard to do this chronologically but I want to get Chris involved in, and everybody here knows that Chris was very closely involved in covering the fire downtown and um, so I want to ask him about that and what that was like. I remember being on the roof, we were trying to set up a camera on the roof of WDAZ and looking downtown and seeing smoke and thinking, oh my God, you know, this can't be good. And coming back in and hearing KCNN saying, you know, because they were still downtown saying, you know, there's something going on, there's, there's a fire 
over at the security building. And uh, so then everybody scrambles, and this is late in the afternoon. And Chris and I don't know if Rob, did Rob Vogel, our right. weekend sports guy, did you guys go right away? Was it, did well, you we, we, when we realized that the roof camera wasn't going to quite bring us the right. story and get us where we needed to be, we, uh, Rob and I surveyed the parking lot for the highest profile vehicle. It happened to be Bob's pickup. And uh, I don't even know if you remember, but we somehow got your keys and jumped in the pickup and took off. It was a circuitous route. It probably took us an hour to get to downtown Grand Forks, um, meandering through the UND neighborhood and up around the north end of town where it wasn't quite as bad. And then about a half mile stretch up down the r railroad tracks, which was elevated. And then about a half mile walk through um, chest deep waters with a camera on her shoulder. and. Uh, and we somehow got to the parking ramp, which is across from Grand Forks Central High School, and it was the perfect vantage point for uh, what turned out to be just uh, an amazing scene. Uh, I think about it so often that if I hadn't had a camera with me, I didn't think anyone would believe what was going on. You couldn't make that up. It was, it was surreal. Um, it, a movie script wouldn't be written that way about a downtown on fire surrounded by water and buildings, you know, blocks over catching on fire. It just, uh, I'll never forget the images of, you know, firemen in the water trying to put this fire out, trying to get the fire hydrants with water surrounding them. It was just amazing. Finally, the battle to fight the fire from the ground became so impossible, they took to the air to drop with chemicals. You guys came back for a bit, and then you went back at night and got more footage. Exactly. The first time around, we actually had to be rescued. Uh, the water had come. Had, we spent about two hours downtown. We had to be rescued because the water had risen that much in that short amount of time. Uh, we thought maybe the fire was under control, but after we had come back, uh, put a story together for the news at that time, the fire had caught on further down the street and a couple more blocks, and we knew the story wasn't over downtown and we made another trip down there with Bob's pickup and, um, and went for round two in the middle of the night and that would have been where the old bonzers stood there and uh, a few other b mainstay buildings there and uh, once again into the parking ramp which was you know elevated for Grand Forks and did a nighttime story as well. Now if we're going to talk about behind the scenes here one of the things that happened is then Bob's keys got locked in his pickup. Do you remember that happening? Right. <laughs> you, you, you know, talking about a movie script, if you throw that in there, somebody would say, well, that's really dumb. Let's leave that out. But <laughs> we get back to the pickup. We're, we're very excited. We're covering a flood and a fire, and we want to get this story back. And I said, Rob, you have the keys? He said, no, you have the keys. I said, no, Rob, you drove. I navigated. I was in the back with the camera shooting. He said, you're right. I did have the keys. And we looked in the ignition. We turned on the light on the camera. It was middle of the night, it was about 1, 2 in the morning, there were the keys in the ignition. At that time, you know, if you, if you could think clearly, you would think, well, let's just break the window <laughs> and drive away. But we were worried about Bob's pickup, and we can't do that, and who do we call? We didn't know what to do. We were, we were on an island, and we were surrounded by water. And yeah, and unfortunately, that leads to a, a situation where I sent Laura Gallegos' husband out to oh, go yes. bring you a set of keys. and. I go out in the parking lot and we're going to send him in a news vehicle because we know the water's gotten higher and we're worried about him, something happening to this vehicle trying to get there. And I say, oh, look, there's a pickup. Maybe you can take that. He's like, oh, that's mine. I'll take it. I'm like, well, maybe you shouldn't. Take a news vehicle. So he jumps in his own pickup, starts driving up Columbia and tries to get over the overpass and ends up getting stuck in the middle of the water out in front of the hospital and basically floods his pickup because I asked him to do this. <laughs> but it all goes back to the keys being locked in the vehicle. Well, and I think too, I, would, I was doing a lot of the on-air work with Terry. We were announcing where people could stay and where they could go. And I think it was two or three days later where I finally said to somebody, I said, where'd my pickup go? <laughs> I mean, I had totally forgot. You guys got a little sheepish look on your, I didn't realize that they had actually taken it. <laughs> so there you go. You're learning things that happen behind the scenes. Well, speaking of reading all those announcements, that was, uh, you keep using the term surreal, but the amount of information that passed through this station during those hours. I mean, literally, except for a half hour here and a half hour there, during the weekend of the flood, once 
you know, like from Friday afternoon to, to at least Monday or Tuesday, other than a few seconds to turn the transmitter off to let it cool down, the station was on the air and people were calling and saying, you know, I'm at, uh, I'm okay, I'm staying here, or people were calling from, you know, all over the thing, I've got room for somebody, I'll take two people, you know, if, if you've got pets, they can come here. I mean, this is just a portion of all of the announcements that we've got in, people who are opening up their homes to the flood victims in the greater Grand Forks area. That just struck me as so odd as it was happening, but it, it happened so much that it, become, it became just commonplace that it was. Many of the resorts in northern Minnesota that were closed yet for the season opened up just to do that. Uh, I think one of the funniest recollections of that situation were, as where WDAZ is on in, in Winnipeg on cable and much of Manitoba, and a lot of the calls we were getting to people would, would take families that say, you know, no pets or no smokers or, you know, we'll take a family, but no. And so we started getting calls from Winnipeg saying, come here, we don't care if you smoke and bring your dogs <laughs> and, and pets along. And then we got calls from the Border Patrol saying you can't get pets across the border unless they have the right papers. So, and we had a lot of things to worry about. There are things that you don't think about that all of a sudden become major issues. And Mike Brew, our former news director, tells the story of a call he got from somebody offering a place in Michigan and he's talking to them, okay, Michigan, North Dakota. Here they were calling from the state of Michigan and tracked down the phone number to the station to, to ask us. And certainly beyond just those messages, there was a lot of news happening. Uh, Terry, I, I mean, there was such a moment and I think I remember coming in and saying something to you on the set. We were just running, we'd run a little break where we'd run a promo just to give everybody a, a, a chance to breathe. And I came in and, and, I, would, and I said something about um, the Lincoln Drive, I think it was Mayor Pat had just said something about we lost Lincoln Drive or, or no, I had been at, at, at a, a press conference at, and I just remember the, the, the look of, you know, another, it was very draining to do it and, and, you know, amazing the amount of time we were spending on the air, but to have like these, you know, okay, yeah, Lincoln Drive is a neighborhood that's really below sea level, below river level, and if it comes over that dike, but then all of a sudden we're talking about spreading out, we're spreading out into the downtown, then it's everything east of Washington. It was really quite difficult to do. I mean, they were watching our city uh, go under. Oh yeah, and, and the other moment that I remember was uh, Lynn Staus on the telephone with us saying, okay, now is the time for people in East Grand Forks to leave. We put up a good fight, but we couldn't quite make it. And for your own safety, I'm asking you to leave the city and come back when things are safe. And just, I don't know why I remember that, but I do. That was, that was a, another terrible moment. But yeah, you're, you're worried about your home, your family. Uh, we had people uh, working here and, and their families were in Bismarck and places like that uh, later on, uh, but they were doing their jobs uh, and, and trying not to think about uh, the rest of it so much. I was on the set with Terry when Mayor Staus called in. <coughs> And the next day, Sunday, late Sunday afternoon, Mike Brew said, you've been here for a couple of days, why don't you take a day off? So I just got out of town. I wanted to get away from here and I stayed with a friend in Fargo for about a day and a half. And the first thing I did when I got down there, I wanted to call my parents in St. Paul. And I called my dad and he said, I saw you on TV here today. And I said, how, how could you see me on TV in the Twin Cities? And he said, well, you were on Channel 11, K-A-R-E. And I said, well, what was I doing? I thought, what, what could this possibly be? And he said, well, it looked like you were sitting on the news set with a priest or a minister of some sort. <laughs> and then I realized he was watching Terry Doolam and me on the set because in, remember at the time, we were dressing a lot more casually than we normally would. We couldn't do laundry or anything. And I had a, a sport coat and a, a shirt, but no tie. And you had a sport, dark sport coat and a dark sport shirt <laughs> under that. So he, he mistook you for a minister or a priest. And Which has never happened before or since. Sometimes so. to this day <laughs> I, I refer to you as Reverend Doolin. Yes. But, uh, and one other thing, getting back to the phone calls, Milo, just that's people, Chris talked about the sights that you remember. I'll remember the sounds. The, we used to think that the phones rang crazily on Friday and Saturday nights during <laughs> the fall and the winter with all the scores coming in. I will never forget, the phone just rang constantly. I, I've never heard that before or since. The, the phone just rang and rang and rang. Another sound I remember, the helicopters outside. We don't get a lot of helicopter traffic here, and it was, there were a lot of news copters up there, government agencies, military. Uh, it was kind of like or, a war zone. Or the zone. jet skis running down. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, 
Well, now, you know, excuse me, but like the phones, uh, we had a lot of people calling volunteering, and I remember we actually had some employees from Mid-Continent who live a couple blocks from here and walked over to help. We had a lot of people calling and asking, what can we do to help? And the biggest issue we had was answering the phones. Mm -hmm. And they actually came in from outside, they walked in and helped us answer the phone for several days. Well, and that's something I think people realize was happening here. I mean, WDAZ station is on South Washington. We really were in an area that was supposed to be evacuated, but they let us stay and they, and because they felt we were providing a, a service to the community. And so really the saving grace to keep us on the air was the fact that porta potties arrived because we had no water just like everybody else. And, and, uh, one of our, our weekend directors' father owned a building just a couple of blocks away. They were doing some renovations, and he went over and pulled the porta potties over and <laughs> put them out in the back by our garage. And if that wouldn't have happened, there's really no way we could have stayed here because the bathrooms were smelling uh, incredibly ripe after a day or two. And you, you could not have to go on. Yeah, we don't need to get too much into that. And you know, it was easy enough to get food and water in the sense that Salvation Army was bringing that stuff to us. But without mm -hmm. bathrooms, we would not have been able to stay. Yeah, I think a lot of the young people from the Salvation Army came every night after the 10, like 11 or 12 o'clock at night with some water and, and some food and uh, sat around and uh, chatted for a little bit. So that was, that was our only access to the outside world at that time. I do remember also uh, there was Target in the mall was one of the only stores still operating and you had gone there to pick up some supplies and you'd come back and said that uh, you, you were, people were just like, oh my gosh, the WDAZ is here, and they were giving well, you almost, yeah. <laughs> and that coming was up and talking to you. And one of the other challenges, I think most of those that were here were, were locked in for three or four days before we really could start getting out again, and Target was one of the few places open, and I called and said, we have a lot of people here that have no uh, clothes or, or any, you know, toothbrush or toothpaste, uh, and can they come in and, and charge? And he said, well, how much? I said, whatever they want to do. And so we kind of sent them out in pairs of two at a time. And uh, everybody charged and had a big long charge thing. And we really appreciated what, what they did for us. So, and I think that's the, the message I think that we learned from the flood and, and this part of the world is that everybody did everything they could for everybody. I mean, they just everybody wanted to help and do something. And after a certain amount of time, then the station put, brought some trailers for us to sleep in. I mean, those first few days, people were sleeping on the floor, sleeping in chairs, whenever they got a chance to sleep. Um, you know, there's a couple of people uh, who come to mind who are behind the scenes type people who basically went, you know, 36 hours before they even took a nap. And so that was sort of surreal. And people, that, some of the people who went to Target early brought back like those floating mattresses that you put in the pool and they blew those up so we would had something to sleep on. I so. think the, the, uh, my daughter, my wife and grandkids were staying in a trailer house down by Thompson. And when we finally, I got, finally got off five or six days of sleeping in a chair in my office, I went there. But I had both kids and all the husbands and all the spouses. I spent one night there and I moved back to the TV station. <laughs> <laughs> it was less hectic. Well, I had a brilliant idea at one point because I, I remember this distinctly because uh, Thursday was the day I, I had, had to stay home and then Friday morning I came in. Um, I remember coming and bringing a sleeping bag and coming to the back just trying to be prepared and I'm walking up through the back of the building and you guys are back there setting up a, a, a sandbag line to, to sandbag the back of the building where some water was coming and I remember you were in the line and I don't know if you remember this happening but uh, you looked at me and you, you had like this look that you couldn't believe I was bringing a sleeping bag that maybe I was overreacting and you were looking at me and somebody threw a sandbag and it hit you right in the gut. <laughs> <laughs> I remember thinking, you know, this is probably the way this is going to go. And sure enough, uh, we ended up, uh, <coughs> excuse me, ending up, ended up having to, to stay here on the floor. Sorry, yeah. No, <laughs> I hope not. Maybe that's coming back. But there were some of those moments of, of levity within what was really quite a disaster. I remember uh, Dennis Egebrotten, who's still with the police department in Grand Forks, being in front of the national media one day and saying, you know, saying his name and then saying, I'm Dennis Egebrotten, the standard spelling of Egebrotten. And, you know, just <laughs> weird things like that. And, and, you know, it was kind of a circus atmosphere here. Uh, we had a reporter who's had her bird here for a while because she Dogs had a no place and, to put it. And there cats. were cats all over the place. I so. remember we were on again, I don't know if it was with Terry or Mike Brew, we were on the air reading the announcements, and Jane Joyce had just gotten off the air, and she came walking behind the camera. Not, washing her hair with bottled water. She was putting it on her hair and trying to wash her hair after a few days. I was always mad at her because she always looked good. And <laughs> no. the rest of us looked <laughs> like <sloth>. not good. <laughs> but she always looked good and, and she did stuff. Yeah, I got jealous enough that I thought I'd be smart and I tried to heat up water in the coffee pot, just water. And 
Then I set it outside. I wasn't dumb enough to pour it on my head right away, but I didn't wait long enough when I actually did oh. it. It was still pretty warm, but I got a little bit of a hair wash. I went from Thursday, that Thursday I showered that night, which I think I probably violated some rule from the mirror to, to shower Thursday night, and then I did not shower again until the, which is not maybe pretty to say, but didn't, speaking of the bathroom, I did not shower again until the following Thursday when I drove to my uncle's house in Castleton, so I drove 80 miles to get a shower one week after we started. But thanks, thanks to Target, we had some clean changes of clothes and the like yeah. as well. Um, you know, we talked about, uh, we, you know, we had this tape, the two-hour tape that we put together and, and talking with, with Chris about, I mean, in the middle of that, there's quite a long, almost an hour of just music and video, and you shot a lot of that mm -hmm. going through with the, with the trucks in and, and different neighborhoods, and that was the other thing. We'd get calls, say, I live in this neighborhood. Can you shoot that? Or I, I do this, and that had to be pretty memorable for you to uh, go on those Humvees, I suppose they were, uh, and shoot. Humvee, boats, helicopters, uh, you name the mode of transportation, and and I was on it 10 years ago. Uh, what I recall about that was some of those days in that April of 97 were some of the nicest spring days mm -hmm. we've ever had. It was sunny, it was warm, it was calm, and we're going down the streets as if it's Venice. And, <laughs> and you're looking at destruction. It was just, it was mind boggling to, to look at this. I would get calls at home, I'd get calls on my cell phone. Did you, did you go by this neighborhood? Could you go by our neighborhood? Do you think we have water on our main floor? Do you think there was water in the basement? People wanted to know what we thought the damage would be to their homes. It, it, was, it was so sad and it was, it was strange. I'll go down the streets of Grand Forks and East Grand Forks now and I'll sometimes tell our new reporters, you know, 10 years ago, we'd be below water right now. And you just can't quite fathom what it was like. Well, that was the other thing, Bob. We were lucky to move here when we did. Yeah, or we'd have been off the air the first day. Yeah, we were <laughs> down where the old uh, U.S. Bank is now. We're... Yeah, we were. Uh, we were. The newsroom oh, sure. was in the basement. In the basement too. Yeah. And it's the studio time, was up but above. But yeah, it was right, right downtown on Demers, and uh, yeah, we wouldn't have made it. We also had plans to, if we needed to, to to broadcast out of Honeyford, uh, a grain elevator there uh, operation, and. Uh, I, I, I remember being on the set <clears throat> reading the announcements on Saturday night and talking to Mark Prather in Fargo uh, uh, with our management in Fargo and he was saying, yeah, we're going to do this and this and this and we're going to put the studio in the grain elevator and I thought, what is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, yeah, we weren't sure we were going to stay here and we right. actually, we have a satellite truck so we brought that and, and, and then uh, our owner brought his mobile home in to, to live and we had an engineer, because we thought we'd have to come into town, shoot drive out to Honeyford, and we were pretty good celebrities out at Honeyford. They brought in, in fact, they ate better than we did here. The, <laughs> oh, the, some yeah. of the area uh, folks came out with fresh, uh, hot food every night. And it, it just magically appeared. The hot dishes would come <laughs> you know, as, as soon as we got there. They, uh, but, but some of us stayed out there for, for a better part of a week or more uh, and, and worked out there, too. This, uh, I guess maybe if we're going to... We could go, I'm sure we could talk about this yeah. for a long time, because really we spent basically from Thursday until, you know, another week and a half after that. I guess the, one of the other memorable events before we wrap this up maybe would be the day that the president came, and I know that, uh, Terry, you were out at the Air Force Base for that, and, and Chris may have been as well. I can't no, remember why you weren't involved with I was, that. Uh, it was our West Coast crew handled that, and we were <laughs> in town. We had two yeah. different crews, so... So that was, I mean, just watching it as it was happening was quite an emotional experience. Uh, you know, you were having to be a journalist at the time, but I guess I'm wondering about your recollections of that day. Uh, it's just surreal again, once again. It, it's, uh, I, I remember uh, watching the, uh, you know, Air Force One land and all of that, which is in itself a sight, you know, anywhere in the world. Uh, and and uh, President Clinton getting off the plane on crutches because he had had to be on crutches at that time. And then I remember the string of people and these sort of familiar faces, and I, and I was a, a ways away, and I couldn't figure out who these people were. It was his, basically, entire cabinet had come with him. And uh, so all these people were, were there to, to support uh, Grand Forks community. We have hardly ever seen such a remarkable demonstration of courage and commitment and cooperation and basic human strength. And we are very impressed and proud to be Americans when we see what you have done in the face of this uh, So I remember that. Uh, I remember at one point one of the lighting instruments 
uh, sure. blew up. That was out at the air base. At the yes. air base. Yeah. And uh, it was lit something like this for, for the presentation. And uh, everyone just kind of jumped, and, and uh, except President Clinton. He just casually looked up, and he was the <laughs> calmest of us all. Talks about what we could do to get proper housing available while you're rebuilding your communities. That's up there. Anybody hurt? Well, we've had a fire, a flood, a blizzard. <laughs> I guess we can take it, God. Going back to the national news that we watched with Katrina, uh, Katrina and seeing the people at the Astrodome. Uh, you know, and a lot of us were out at the base in, in what they call in one of their uh, the hangars with all those people out there. And, and watching Katrina and seeing that brought back memories for me, having been out there, the smell and some of the people most, a lot of elderly people not knowing what to do and just lined up cot after cot in what they call the three bay hangar. And, and, uh, and, and that's just one other point, I think, that the, with the air base that uh, we thank God that they were there because we couldn't have done it without their help, even starting before when they kind of took over the sandbagging operation. Right, uh, yeah, how much we relied on them. Chris, you talked about nowadays when you take somebody out and you say, oh, remember this water. I mean, what, what strikes you about, I mean, I think most people say, well, this is a, a pretty amazing uh, steps that we've taken since then. But I mean, what what stands out in your mind from that seeing it pretty firsthand to, to where the community is now? Um, the lack of complaining by people um, just going to work immediately. How quickly people wanted to get into their homes and turn something that was horrible and dirty and wrecked back into something whole again and just doing it, and people who didn't have any structural damage going and helping people muck out their basements, which is probably one of the worst jobs you could ever imagine. But just doing it and walking along the streets and saying, can I help you guys out? Uh, that, how, how um, people kind of bonded together to do all the, the uh, necessary things, and it, it was almost seamless. I know there's been a lot of heartache and financial uh, heartaches for people, but we didn't, you know, at the time I thought, well, we're at about 50,000 in 97 in population. I, I can't imagine we'll have 25,000 when, when this is all done. And I would say we're, you know, just a little bit above that right now, above uh, 50,000, and people stayed. And, and I don't know where else in the country you could have something like this happen and people calling and saying, I'm inviting complete strangers into my home come on in. Uh, if, if a flood like this had to happen somewhere, you know, I think the uh, Red River Valley probably could handle it better than anywhere else in the world. Gary, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add before we wrap uh, up? Well, again, just what, what Bob mentioned, the, 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 uh, the air base contribution was just immeasurable. They, uh, I've covered floods earlier. I covered 79, and, and, and the air base uh, people have always been instrumental in sandbagging and whatnot. But this time, in, in 1997, I don't know where we'd be, you know, without them, because uh, that was the place for people to go to who had nowhere else to go, and some stayed for a long, long time there, and they were treated well, I think, almost to a person, and uh, I think we owe them a huge uh, debt of gratitude. Bob, anything you'd like to say before we finish? No, I, and I agree with what everybody said. I think gratitude to of the staff of WDAZ and those people that were here. It just, uh, it's something nobody, unless you went through it, can uh, understand. And I certainly, in management, appreciate everything that, that they did and the hard work that they, they put into it. And, uh, I think that's something, you know, we were talking about behind the scenes that we, we did an anniversary show one year after, and we, we talked a bit about the kind of people who were, and many of them still here, who worked almost harder than the people who were on air because they were having to, you know, this tape and stuff was coming back into the building and they were having to just run it whenever they could. Um, people who basically manned some of those technical positions where, okay, you, you have a past of being on air from a long ways back so you could step in and do that, but nobody could do their job. So there were only a handful of people with the technical knowledge to do it and the fact that they manned those positions for hour after hour after hour has always been something that impressed me from from the entire experience and just knowing that so many people stepped up behind the scenes in front of the camera and, and just you know pulled it all together it's it, it's always you know because of just the disaster I've always said that's the biggest story I'm ever going to cover in my life as far as affecting so many people in my viewing area 
Um, but you know, from a personal side too, just the fact that, that people pulled together so much here at DAZ and made it happen too is, is something I know I'll never experience again either because of the fact that it was so unbelievable how it was happening. I remember we finally went, we're gonna take a break one night that Monday night or something at two in the morning and everybody was sleeping because they hadn't, hadn't slept much and, and, uh, and you were wrapping up on the air and I said to somebody in the newsroom and I still didn't have much of a voice, I said, I hope he doesn't give out the number again. And then, <laughs> and, and then you were like, so if you need to call us, dial. And I was the only one there and the phone started ringing and I'm like, oh, okay, he gave out the number again. Then people started calling and so, you know, we did what we had to do. So Pat, we'll ask you, uh, uh, you were a longtime resident leading up to this point. It was, I mean, it was hard on everybody to experience it. Well, I, actually, I was one of the lucky ones where I lived north of the Columbia Mall. Uh, it stayed dry. But uh, Ted Peterson, uh, then our production manager, let me stay at his place in Thompson for a few nights just to, to get a shower and then just a nice comfy bed. And uh, that was like heaven to me uh, at that time. But just to echo what everybody said, uh, it was just a great example of what this community and what this station could do when the chips were down. And uh, I've always said we're the little station that could. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not getting choked up. I think I'm catching your uh, laryngitis from then, but uh, it, it's something none of us will ever forget. Well, I think uh, Erin Hayes, who was the ABC reporter, very excellent reporter, and she covers disasters all over the country f for ABC News. Uh, was very complimentary of the work that we did and she was very nice in fact she called the year later when we won a, a national edward r murrow award for our flood coverage and congratulated us and that always was special to me too that she even remembered a year later because she'd moved on to other disasters and <laughs> you know she remembered us and, and called to congratulate us for for winning it. I hope you enjoyed watching this behind the scenes, behind the scenes look at how WDAZ covered the flood of 1997. It was certainly the hardest and most important work any of us will ever be a part of, and we've enjoyed sharing a bit of that experience with you.